Productions. Verily, your praise is due to the Almighty Lord. We praise Him, we seek His aid. We beseech forgiveness to Him. We seek refuge with the Almighty from the evil of our souls and our evil actions and our shortcomings. He whom Allah Ta'ala guides is rightly guided. And he whom Allah Ta'ala misguides can never ever be guided. I bear witness without any compulsion that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah Ta'ala. He indeed created Adam, alayhi salam, our father, whereby after creating Adam, alayhi salam, he examined him. However, Adam fell in sin, but being the most gracious, most merciful, the all-forgiving, he forgave him and guided him. The sender of Noah, who built the ark by the will of the Almighty Lord, the one who saved the father of the prophets Ibrahim from the fire, commanding it to be cool and peace on Ibrahim alayhi salam. The one who sent Moses ibn Umran to Pharaoh with clear proofs, clear signs. However, Pharaoh alayhi mayistahikku min Allah was those of disobedient. He sent Isa alayhi salam ibn Maryam to the people of Israel with the mightiest signs and he sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to all humanity with the greatest miracle ever revealed to mankind. The very word of the Almighty Lord, the uncreated word, the, glory, the glorious Quran. May Allah bless him, his family, his companions and all those that follow them with righteousness to the last day. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us in a beautiful hadith, Inna Iblisa yada'u arshahu ala al-ma' thumma yab'athu sarayah fa'adnahum minhu manzilah a'zamuhum fitnah fayajiru ahaduhum wa yakul fa'altu kada wa kada fayakulu lahu Iblis ما صنعت شيئا ثم يجيء وحدهم فيقول ما تركته حتى فرقت بينه وبين مرأته فيدنيه منه إبليس ويقول نعم أنت إبليس عليه ما يستحق من الله sets his throne on the sea and from there he sends out his troops, his army, his soldiers, the devils to tempt mankind. And the closest to him is the one that causes the greatest temptations. One of them comes after being sent and he says, I did not leave so and so until he committed such and such. Iblis looks at him and says, you have done nothing. You have done nothing. Then another comes and says, I did not leave so and so until I made him separate from his wife. So he draws him close to him and says, how fine are you? How fine you are? How good you are. Because he destroyed between a husband and a wife. But the other one could not do so. He probably caused some tension, some friction between the two. But he could not destroy the relationship between the two. He could not cause division. So he was not as good as the latter. Dear brothers and sisters, every single human being, every single jinn, is in a continuous battle. A battle like no other battle. It's not like you're on the battlefield and fighting the enemy which you can see. This battle is from the day that we were born to the day that we die. The battle with the ugly two-horned deceiving liar, the accursed Iblis alayhi mayistahikku min Allah ta'ala. He approaches man, not from the front and that's it, no. 
from the left, from the right, from the front and from the back. And from high and from low. He approaches man on every occasion, time and place. He has made the earth that we are walking on the borders of his battlefield. He enters the soul of man, this accursed shaitan. Beautifies disobedience to man. Carrying nothing, wallahi, but false promises and glimmering desires. You know, you say something that glimmers. Iblis and his army. They poison, they poison their victims. They poison the heart, they blacken the heart. By beautifying the ugly. By beautifying the evil. By beautifying the wickedness. But why? Why does he want to beautify for us gambling? Or cheating? Or procrastination? Or woman? Or illicit intercourse? Or riba or music or any other evil? Why? What's he after? What have we done to him? Iblis is going to hellfire. He wants every single human being to be thrown in a hot pit of fire and prevented from the gardens of bliss. It is nothing but a struggle. A struggle with man for dominance. That's all it is. He knows he's going to hellfire. Thus he wants all humanity and all jinn to follow him. So he will work on you. And he will work on you. And wallahi, he does not despair. He does not tire. He does not give up. If he cannot drive you to kufr or to shirk, to major sin. Not to major sin, to minor sin. And he will work and work and work until he glues you, glues you to him. And then he will drive you with him on the day of resurrection due to you following him into hellfire. Thus, destruction. For this the same person, the man with rationality, with common sense, must be on his guard, his utmost power against this enemy, this accursed, who has placed, manifested his enmity ever since the creation of Adam. And desiring nothing, our brothers and sisters, but to corrupt your Iman, your belief, and wreak havoc in your life. We must fortify ourselves against this enemy. And the only way, Wallahi, we can ever, ever do this. You know, a lot of us say, Wallah, I'm powerful. I'm strong against the shaitan. But when he goes outside, the devil has beaten him, whether it is the gaze which is haram, whether it is gambling, smoking a cigarette, drinking alcohol, sittings or gatherings of obscenity indecency. Yet he says, no, I'm powerful. The shaitan's got no chance against me. Then what's he doing? He has defeated you. As for the person who fulfills the obligations of the Almighty Lord. After the obligation, this is the guard, this is the weapon we are talking about. This is the ammunition and the only ammunition that you can ever use to beat, to defeat this accursed. First and foremost, by fulfilling Allah's obligations. Then, by fulfilling the optional duties, whether, whether it is prayer, Fasting, Hajj, Umrah, Remembrance, wherever you walk, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, wherever you walk, always freshen your tongue with the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala. And the shaitan, Wallahi, will weaken and weaken and weaken because whoever possesses a strong faith, 
Wallahi wa billituhim and billituhim and destroy him. Look at Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. The great caliph. The great khalifa. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about this man. Certainly O oh Umar I see the devil fleeing from you. Oh Umar, what are you doing? I see the devil fleeing from you. It's only a small little thing. Hiding from Umar. This is the devil of Umar. That is connected to Umar. Karino. But he ran away from Umar. Allahu Akbar. Imagine your shaitan running away from you. Allah is beautiful, isn't it? Get the hammer and belt him. <laughs> But the only way you can do that is how? By fulfilling Allah's law and no other. The greatest way to defeat this accursed is seeking protection, seeking refuge, seeking shelter in the Almighty Lord. In Rabbil Alameen, Rabbil Falaqa, Rabbil Nas. In the Lord of daybreak, in the Lord of men, in the Lord of creation. And thus, this is what we're going to do tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Learn what Surah Al-Falaq is and Surah Al-Nas is. And inshallah ta'ala, with a little elaboration, we might understand the definition of these verses. So when we recite it in our prayer, inshallah ta'ala, we know what we are reciting and not just to recite it because we have to recite it. No, we recite it because the Almighty Lord has commanded us to use these verses against this devil. Use it as a shield. And these two saw, and nas wal falak, the popularity of these are extremely high. And everyone knows that. Why? Because they contain an official instruction, an official command order, which is to take refuge in the Almighty Lord and none but Him. Seeking His protection, His safety, His guard against everything in the face of any source of evil, whether hidden or visible, known or unknown, minor or major. For have we not taken him as our Lord? Have we not taken Allah Ta'ala as our protector? As our guardian, as our master? So if you have so, what do we do? If you want genuine protection, genuine safety, genuine guard, the only one you can resort to is Rabbil Alameen, Rabbil Falaqa, and Rabbil Nas, the Lord of Daybreak, the Lord of men and the Lord of Al Alameen. And we know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved these two surahs dearly. As Ubbatu ibn Amir narrates in the hadith collected by Muslim ibn Hijaj that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Have you not heard the unique verses that were revealed last night? He mentioned, Kul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. And Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Say, I seek refuge in Allah, Lord of Daybreak and Lord of Men. And likewise, in Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, collected the hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before going to sleep every single night, he will place his hands together like this. He will place them together, blow into them, and recite Al-Ikhlas, Kul Huwa Allahu Ahad, Al-Falaq, Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbi Al-Falaq, and Al-Nas, Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbi Al-Nas. Then he will wipe his hands of whatever is possible of his body. Starting from his head, his face, and then the front of his body and so forth. He would repeat this three times, every single time he went to bed. But why is he doing this? Because if we know the understanding, the definition of these verses, this is a strong shield against this accursed devil. Wallah, he cannot stand it. He hates it. Likewise, when he was ill, he suffered from illness. He would repeat this uh, action every time he became ill, throughout the day or night. And if he could not do it on his behalf, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha 
would recite on his behalf and wipe his hands over his body. And that was collected by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and Muslim ibn Hijaj in their Sahih. Likewise, the scholars have said that these two surahs, Al-Falaq wa nas was specifically revealed for exorcism, which is the expelling of the devils and of evil spirits. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disliked exorcism to be made in other than these two surah. And likewise, we know the hadith, the famous hadith of Zayd ibn Arqam, that a Jew came and cast a magical spell on whom? On Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that Jew's name was whom? Lubayd ibn Ahsan. So when Muhammad sallam was be, uh, struck by black magic, and he started suffering from this, Jibreel alayhi salam came down to him, revealed to him al maw'awwidatayn, which is al-falak wa nas and then informed him of who, of who cast a spell, and in which well the charm was placed in. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi straight away told Ali ibn Abi Talib, go fetch the charm, go fetch the spell, grab it, and untie the charm slowly, one by one, untie it. And recite with the untying, Kul a'udhu bi Rabbi al-Falaq and Kul a'udhu bi Rabbi al-Nas. So when he did that, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up as though he's been released after being tied by rope. So we know these sword are very, very deadly against the devil. And I'm pretty sure those who do uh, exor exorcisms, they will understand this because wallahi, We've witnessed, we've witnessed this many times, especially the verse مِن شَرِّ نَفَّثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ Wallahi, you repeat this on this person who's possessed or struck by black magic. It's though, Wallahi, you're getting a sword and stabbing him, and stabbing him, and stabbing him. And the more you say it, Wallahi, this is witnessed, Wallahi Azim. The more you say it, the more aggro he becomes. He becomes wild. This is the devil himself. So when you say, we say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَرَقِ And you get to, وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ You should see the situation of this possessed. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, your hair will stand up. Wallahi, your hair will stand up. And this is not a myth. This is the reality. So we start بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَرَقِ قل هي سي I seek refuge in the Almighty Lord I seek refuge in the Almighty Lord of daybreak Al-Falaq in Arabic terms mean daybreak You can actually take it as mean in a vaster sense where it's all the creation with reference as it breaks out throughout life, throughout the life So I seek refuge in the Almighty Lord Lord of the daybreak من شر ما خلق from the evil of that which he created, of that which he created. This is in conjunction with the hadith by Muslim on the authority of Khawlat bint Hakim that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he went to a place, he would say, مَن نَزِلَ مَنزِلًا فَقَالْ أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّاتِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ لَمْ يَضُرَّهُ شَيْءٌ حَتَّى يَرْحَلَ مِنْ مَنزِلِهِ ذَلِكَ Whoever goes to a place, this is relating to all of us, whoever goes to a place, to a dwelling, and says, I seek refuge in Allah's perfect words, perfect words, the place that you dwell, you're going to go in, nothing will harm you, until you depart that place. So you're seeking refuge from what but? From the evil of those creatures that you have created. Uh, so nothing will ever touch you while being in that state, in that place until you depart. Now we've got to understand a very important issue here. We are not allowed Islamically to attribute evil as Allah's creation. In other words, the creation of evil is not attributed to Allah Ta'ala. However, the creation of the creatures is attributed to Allah Ta'ala and evil to whom? To the creatures. In other words, you are not allowed to say, 
I seek refuge in Allah from the evil you have created. That is haram. But you say, I seek refuge in Allah from the things of that which you have, from the evil of the things of that which you have created. In other words, it is not allowed, dear brothers and sisters, we've, we've seen this many times from a lot of sisters and brothers. They say, why did Allah create this evil? Allah did not create anything at all for the sake of evil. Audhu billah min dhalik. Allah created everything in good and for great wisdom. However, in creation there is evil. For example, you get a person there. Is that a creation of evil? It's a normal person. No! But in that person, he might commit something that is evil. So Allah created that person, but He did not create the evil that this person is doing. Is that understood? So we are not allowed to attribute evil to Allah's creation, but we attribute the creation of creatures to Allah and evil to the creatures. And we should seek refuge of Allah in Allah Ta'ala at all times from the evil, whether taking place or not taking place. For example, things that have taken place like disease, injury, accidents, possession, magic, the evil eye, epilepsy, schizophrenia, and so forth. Anything that has taken place, we seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala alone. Believing with our utmost belief that He and He alone is the only one that can cure us from this evil. Likewise, we take, we seek refuge in Allah from that which has not taken place. That's what we say all the time, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah. Isn't this a common saying? Whenever you go, wherever you go, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah min thalik. Meaning I seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala from that. You are ask, actually asking the Almighty Law to protect you, to put you in a state of safety, to safeguard you from approaching that evil. So things that have not taken place like shirk or kufr or superstitions or innovations or major or minor sins or anything, always seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala. Don't think you're always safe. You're not safe. Because the shaitan, don't forget, is trying to target you. He's always focusing on you. And when he sends his troops, he won't send any person, any, any being to you. He will strong, he'll send to you a powerful one if you are a strong Muslim. And the weak one if you're not even a Muslim. Because even the non-Muslims have shayateen at all times. The more stronger you are Islamically, the stronger you're going to get from those devils. The stronger devil you will get. And so forth. And the strongest ones were, the strongest test and the greatest test was to whom? The Prophets of Allah Sallallahu Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So we've got to understand the devil is always working very hard on you. That's why you always should seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala, whether you think you're safe or not. Whether you think you're safe or not, always seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala. And in any place you go, whenever you go to a place, Always say, A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tamati min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in Allah's perfect words, perfect words from the evil of those creatures that He has created. Wa min sharri ghasiqin idha wakab. And from the evil of the darkening as it brings the dark. Have you understood that? In other words, we seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala from the evil, from the calamities, that are at night time, in the night. And we all know that the night generally, the crimes appear, acts of wickedness are intense. People, it's, people at night time find it horrifying in itself, the night. Why? Because to, them, to a lot of people, evil thoughts and passions are revived in the night, especially in a state of solitude. Likewise, anxieties, worries, which entail to uh, depression and stress, uneasiness, discomfort. And I'm pretty sure everyone understands this. And why do I call it nightclubs? Huh? Because there's nothing in there but evil. And if you look at it, you go, look, in our Western life here, you know, Western civilization, look at outside at night time. You see the lights flashing, the clubs and alcohol being drunk and you know, illicit intercourse being performed, then strip clubs and everything. The works. But in the day it's a bit lighter than that. 
Night time, brothers and sisters, there can be a lot of evil in it. That's why the Muslim should always, at all times, try to be at home at night and do not leave your house. Especially if you are living in a society, in an environment like ours. It could be very, very, very dangerous. Likewise, at night, there's a lot of raids, especially before, Isl before the Islamic times. There used to be a lot of raids where the attackers attacked at night. And still to this day, you know, causing destruction and a lot of catastrophes at night. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was plotted against at night time. Likewise, Umar ibn Khattab. He was assassinated at, at night time. Like with a lot of pious predecessors, likewise, they were killed in the night. Because they see it as a place of hiding. A place of hiding. Likewise, at night, there's a lot of harmful animals. That's when the savage beasts come out or the hissing poisonous creatures come out. So we know the night in general, we should be very, very careful. And always say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-Rajim. A'udhu Billahi min shaitan al-Rajim. Especially at night, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِن شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَكَبْ And we seek, the, we seek refuge in Allah ta'ala from the evil of the darkening as it brings its darkness. وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ And from the evil of the blowers of the knot. And I'm pretty sure every single one of us know this. It's the various type of magic especially the magicians that tie knots onto a thread or a string and then they blow upon them. It's very common to a lot of sorcerers, a lot of soothsayers, a lot of magicians, a lot of these imposters. They grab the string or thread, they tie the knots and they place all their, for example, if they want to uh, strike a person with black magic, or bewitch him, they'll get either his nail, or hair, or his garment, and they'll tie it on that, put it in a charm, and they blow on it. And then they'll affect man's reasoning, or they'll cause division between a husband and wife, or they'll cause a person to become sick, all by the will of the Almighty Lord. But this is what the, refer the verse is referring to. And we know, dear brothers and sisters, as we've taken before, that magic is nothing but a production of illusion. That's all it is. It is nothing, wallahi, but a production of illusion which is subject to a magician's design. He designs it. And these imposters, wallahi, the practitioners of magic and trickery, they're increasing by the day. And all they do is steal and steal from the feeble, ignorant Muslims. And they're everywhere. Wallahi, they're everywhere. But why? What do they want? And how can they become like that? These people are kuffar. And I warn all my brothers and sisters, do never ever go to a person who thinks he knows the future. And there are many out there. In Liverpool, there are many. Many, many sorcerers out there that are claiming to know the future. They claim to know where your shoes were stolen or lost. They claim to know what you ate last night. They are working with the devil. And this is a serious crime and it is kufr to do such things. What makes them being able to do these acts? See, they work with things that are in secret. The devils. This is the magicians. They work with things in secret which enable them to perform illusions to confuse man and to deceive their eyes. Making the watcher think he has seen something, but in fact he's seen nothing. And the best example of this is what? Pharaoh's magicians. When Pharaoh's magicians, did they not bewitch the eyes of man? And then they struck terror in their hearts. And then they said that we are the only lords. And our lord is Pharaoh. And they displayed a great magic. But the reality of the situation was what? Yeah, the appearance to the onlooker when they'd done this, when they performed this, it was like that their ropes and their sticks changed to snakes moving fast in the valley. But was it really true? 
Did they really change into snakes and uh, into snakes, their sticks and ropes? Did they? Or did they not? They did not. It was the sight of theirs that changed and their sticks and ropes remained exactly the same as they were. It was nothing but an illusion brought by the magician himself. Because he makes you sense other than the reality. For example, something might come out of the shop or your house without even you realizing it. He might pour, for example, show you this is a cup. And I might look to you, it's a cup, it stays as a cup. But to you, because it changes that side of yours, that, that illusion now, it might be a chicken or an egg. And that's how it looks. Now it's the reality of magic. It's kufr. They change people's sight. That's why they are being supported and followed and loved. So when the Antichrist comes down, they follow him. They will follow him. Because they accept these devils. And it's easier to accept him when he comes with that evil he gets with. He comes with. But these people, brothers and sisters, will lie out destroying people. You see men who have extreme hatred towards his spouse, his wife, after loving her. You see an attitude of a person inside his house much different than that which is outside. How many men have come to me and said, Faze, I haven't the inner bit of, I'm unable to consummate with my wife. I don't know why. Sudden change of behavior without any obvious reason. Loss of appetite for food. A sudden love or obedience to a particular person for no reason. Frequent miscarriage for women, pregnant women. A strong repulsion when the Quran is being recited or Islam is being given or me dhikr. He can't stand it. Nightmares at night, frequent nightmares. Episodes of unconsciousness, epileptic attacks. All these are symptoms and symbols of struck, struck by black magic. And there are many out there that are feeling like this, wallahi. You know how many calls you get per week? People are suffering and suffering from this devil. From these so-called devils, the so-called magicians, so-called sorcerers, and the so-called mashayikh. And they claim that they are the stronger mashayikh and they are the real mashayikh. And you get those ignorant, feeble-minded Muslims, as I said. They say, no, no, this person is great. He knows such and such. Go to him, go to him. He doesn't charge much. And each charm is worth over $300. And that charm is all nothing but kufr and shirk in it. And the thing is, a lot of people... When attacked by such things, they think that they can cure it on their own. If not, they go to uh, the same person or another person similar to him to cure his problem. We under, we've got to understand that the only way you can cure possession or if you are struck by black magic is the way that it is mentioned to us in the Quran and Sunnah. First and foremost, one must put his full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that He is the only one that can cure you. No one else. Wallahi, no one else. We are all creatures. We are all useless. We are nothing. We are deficient. We are weak. He is the one that created us. And He is the only one that can cure us. The recitation, as we mentioned, of Surah Al-Falaq, Al-Nas, Al-Ikhlas, Ayat verses from Surah Al-Baqarah, whether it is the mention of Sulaiman or the last two of Al-Baqarah, last two verses, or Ayat Al-Qursi, or a lot of other verses in Baqarah, Al-A'raf, Ali Imran, Taha, and many other verses, which is very powerful on the devil. Very powerful. He cannot stand, Wallah, he cannot stand the Quran being recited on him. See, when you see a person struck by magic or possessed, he shakes. He shakes. Very strongly. He's not shaking, it's the one inside him shaking. And you can beat him and beat him and beat him and he does not feel anything, the human being. He feels nothing. 
Wallah, he once told me, bolted one. So hard. So the brother said to me, Faiz, what are you doing? Take it, you're gonna kill him. I said, he doesn't feel nothing. And when, alhamdulillah, Allah killed him and extracted the devil from him, he did not know that he even got touched. And not, wallahi, one mark was on his body. He did not feel anything. And seriously, I say this with all trust. I built him so hard that if I built a normal person, he probably would have died. And it wasn't with uh, just a normal, uh, you know, stick like a, you know, it's a pencil next, like a pencil. No, it was like a softball bat. But those timber ones, the wooden ones, you know, cheapos. <laughs> so much so that when it was built in him, it broke in half. And I had other guys at the same time with bells and snooker pulled in a pulled sticks and <laughs> seriously I'm not this is wallahi this is genuine brothers and he woke up after the devil came out of him alhamdulillah it's about three and a half four hour operation with not in a theater in a room and he came out of it as though he is a new person in this life because I feel different what's happened to me I feel like a new person, wallahi. I said to him, did you feel anything? Is there any pain there? Is there any sores? Because why? What would you do to me? I go, no, no. Said, you alright? Alhamdulillah. Relax. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, wallahi. He was relaxed. He was relaxed. And he had a very comfortable sleep that night. And he told me that I haven't slept so comfortably before for a long time. Because the, the, the devil affects him, subhanAllah. Affects a human being. Especially at night, with nightmares. So brothers and sisters, this is the reality. The devil is there and he will possess you. He will possess you, wallah, he will possess you. So put yourself on that guard. Strengthen yourself to his, with Islam. With remembrance, with dhikr, with iman. Likewise, another way is with the authentic supplications. You know, a person, if he's possessed, you read authentic supplications on him. Likewise, if you know the element, like the charm, where it is, you grab the charm as it was done by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and you untie it. And that, inshallah, will cancel this magical spell and will foil the intentions of that shaitan, the magician himself. Likewise, another way of doing it is by getting or crushing seven lotus tree leaves, putting it in a bucket or in a container or bowl uh, with enough water that a person can bar from the one that's affected. And inshallah that will help him as well through the exorcism uh, operation. Likewise, if you know the magician that actually struck this person with magic, with magic, you grab him with the ear you say to him, undo that charm. You force him. You say, you either undo it, this is the reality now, Allah. You either undo it, or we will execute you. And naturally, he's going to be scared, especially if you're a beast, you know, mashallah. And then, after he unties the knots, the charm, you execute him anyway. <laughs> and this is the correct opinion, it's not my opinion. This is in accordance to Islamic Sharia. Yani Audu Billah, he's corrupting here people. He's hurting people. He's destroying families. He's destroying personalities. He's destroying homes. He's a devil. And he's subhanAllah, he's intruding in people's lives. Imagine you got a life, you're living comfortably with your family. Everything's fine. You love your you love your wife and she loves you. You love your children, they love you. Everything's working out beautiful in your life. And then a shaitan comes and wants to interfere in your life. How would you feel? Suddenly, that love, that desire for your family is finished. How would you feel? How would you feel? Wallahi, you want to skin that person alive. Skin him, not kill him. Skin him. First layer, second layer, and so forth. And then you just tie him up. You don't, you don't kill him. When the three layers, how many layers of skin is there? Three? Ten layers, say. Ten layers are finished. 
He's tied up. Let Allah create the new layers on him. Let him, you know, put, you know, nurture him, nurse him. And when the new layers come, do it again. <laughs> That's how you feel. He's destroyed your life. You are married in a beautiful family, living Islamically, and he comes in corruption. Like a lot of people, they go to psychiatrists, psychiatrists they go to doctors, they go to professors, they go to people who think they understand their intellectuals, mashallah, or they go to uh, counselors or advisors. But, you know, these are the possessed, possessed people now, are struck by black magic. In order to treat themselves against this evil thing, these people cannot help these affected people unless they do what? The treatment taught by Allah and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wallahi, no matter what they do, how, long, how much they work on this person, how much money he puts into this operation, they can do nothing. And we've got a great example. Wallahi, this happened right here in the center. One of the brothers, one of my students, he's here tonight. He saw a man who was a Hindu. He was a Hindu. That was before the renovation of this place. He saw a man being affected. He saw him un like he was uh, uncomfortable. And he was acting weird, paranoid. And the doctor, after seeing him, could not do anything for him. The brother said, look, you know, I can take you somewhere that probably they can help you. So he brought him at midday into the center. He goes, Faiz, I've got a situation here. This person looks like he's possessed. I said, come in. You know, how you going? You're walking. What can we do for you? He wouldn't even talk to me. Wallahi, he wouldn't talk to me. Salim was there that day. He wouldn't talk to me and some other brothers. Yusuf was there. He wouldn't talk to me. Anyway, his eyes were very, very snow like that. Very as frisky, like he was scared. As soon as he saw me. I said, Ahla, sahla, wa marhaban. Take him inside the office, we'll see what we can do. I said, you know, you're welcome down, we're not going to hurt you, it's not a problem. But if he knew what we we're going to do to him, he wouldn't have been in office. <laughs> anyway, after the operation, and I could hear Yusuf saying on the ears, his ears on the wall, what you're hearing, the battens, the pull stick tables, and ah, and this and that. And it turned out he had four jeans in him. Four jeans, wallahi. Alhamdulillah, Allah extracted all of them. And when he left, like when they left, sorry, he looked at me and said, who are you? And what am I doing here? And how, why do I feel so calm and relaxed? Anyway, after the batting, he felt nothing, wallahi. He came back to me on a Saturday morning as I was given the ladies class here. And the ladies were sitting inside the ladies section. And I was giving the lesson, and there was no one in front of me, right? <laughs> and he just stood on top of the stairs there. He looked at me, and I was yelling, and shouting, and moving my hands left and right. I was giving a lesson. So he looks at me, because I think this guy needs reading. <laughs> and he kept looking at me. He was scared, Wallahi, he was scared. So he thought himself still affected by possession. <laughs> he was going to walk back down. Then I said, stop. Don't be scared. Come in. And he was walking like a snail. <laughs> and I was here yelling and shouting. And when he came here, I said, bro, there's a lesson inside, this ladies. <sighs> <laughs> he sat down. He goes, all I want to say to you is, just one thing. Thank you very much. I don't know what you did, but last night, this is Wallahi his statement. For the last three years, I could not sleep properly. Last night, I had the most comfortable sleep in my life. I got Alhamdulillah. And that person after that was interested, I haven't seen him since, but was interested in Islam, wants to know about Islam. But this is the reality, brothers. This is the reality. Magic is a fact. Possession is a fact. It can happen to anyone. And the only way you can cure it is by the Quran and Sunnah. Not by those devils. By, using, by making you drink blood or whatever. And the last verse of Al-Falaq is وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ And uh, from the evil 
of the envier when he envies. And I'm pretty sure everyone knows what, en what jealousy is and what envy is. But believe me, brothers and sisters, envy and jealousy are among the most destructive emotions and feelings a person can have. Because it causes the person to wish what? Evil on others. He wished for others on, you know, evil. And when misfortune happens to them, how does he become sad? He becomes happy. Scholars have said, envy or jealous person, he can reach to a certain degree of kufr. Why? Because he thinks that Allah has not been fair on him. And he deserves more than what he's been given. You know, why has this person got such and I haven't got this? But we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, that Allah Ta'ala deliberately gives people more than others. Whether it is beauty, knowledge, intelligence, children, assets, wealth, life, any blessing. He gives people more than others. Wallahu faddala ba'dakum ala ba'din fi risk Allah has favored others over others in provision, in sustenance. At the same time, He commanded us not to want that which you haven't got, others have. وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بعض. And do not wish for that which he has favored others with. But why? Because these blessings are nothing but tests, exams. The more blessings that you receive from the Almighty Lord, the more exams you will encounter. And do the materials of this life, the materials of this life, do they make one superior to another? Absolutely not. Materials of this life does not make you superior to another. True superiority lies in what, brothers and sisters? Lies in nothing but faith in Allah Ta'ala. As He clearly says explicitly, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Indeed, the most noble, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the one that is most pious, righteous. And in order to discourage envy and jealousy, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us this too, do not look to those who are above you, but look to those who are below you. And that will be an easier way to remind yourself of Allah's blessings upon you. And if we knew the evil that is in jealousy and envy, we would never do it. As Sulaiman ibn al-Ash'ath, Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood, mentions in an authentic narration, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْحَسَدْ فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدَ يَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ كَمَا يَأْكُلُ الْحَطَبْ النار. Beware of jealousy and envy, for indeed, jealousy destroys good deeds, just as fire destroys wood. So we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, even though your brother or your sister's got more than you, do not desire it. Do not want it. These are materials of this life. The only time that you should desire something from your brother is when? Faith. When you see this person doing more Islam, performing more righteousness than you. You desire that. You don't desire it in the sense where you want to uh, eye gouge him, strike him, whap, kill him, which is the ain. No. But you desire what he's got so you can be like him and better. Because the evil eye is a fact and it's reality. Wallahi Azim. So be very, very careful. Whenever you like something, whenever you feel something is beautiful, you say, you say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah all the time. But what do you say? Subhanallah. When you see something that you like, what do you say? Masha'Allah. Tabarakallah. Not Masha'Allah. You can say it. it's a common thing. But it is Tabarakallah. Because that is what came to us through authentic narrations. And MashaAllah, there is no base for that. It is Tabarakallah. Every time you see something you like, you desire, whether on yourself or in yourself or in your belongings or in your assets or with other people, you always say Tabarakallah. وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانَ أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ InshaAllah we'll leave it now for any questions. Brother Salim is mentioning about the amulets and the talismans. What is the law of the amulets and talismans? People seek refuge in 
talismans or amulets. This is like a hijab in the Arabic language. And they are things that they are placed on their shoulders, uh, like a triangle sort of covering with a you know, bobby pin in it, which is stuck on your shoulder, or placed in your car, or underneath your pillow, or wherever, hung on the wall. People use this as a protection against evil or to gain benefit. This is shirk. This is shirk. You are not allowed to use any of these. Inna tamaima shirkun wa kufr. Indeed, the, tem the tal talismans and amulets are disbelief and, and shirk. So you've got to be very careful that we do not accept any amulets, any talismans. It's not part of Islam and it will never be part of Islam and it's not the Prophet Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So beware Likewise people wear beads for children The beads The blue beads Against the evil eye This is A'udhu Billah Shirk In SubhanAllah How can people Place Their belief In a created little object What's that gonna do? A little blue bead And some of us got eyes on it yeah, What's that gonna do? It's a creative thing, it's a little thing that's kind of, kind of, you know, if you put it on the ground and step on it, it's broken. What's it going to do? And people believe that will prevent the eye. Or the horseshoe for good luck. The horseshoe placed upwards, do not place it downwards, they say. You know, they place it like this. The opening towards the sky. Why? They say if you place it the other way, the good, the good luck falls out. MashaAllah, a lot of good luck in it, isn't it? A lot of good luck in it. Or the rabbit's foot, and so forth, and many other so-called good luck and bad luck charms. And they are all uh, shirk charms. They're called the charms of shirkiyah. <laughs> Is there a reason why the jinn possess human beings? Is there a reason? Yes, there are reasons. Lack of faith. You might disturb a jinn accidentally and it can happen. Uh, you might walk around their houses fully naked. And a jinn will desire you and will possess you. You might not enter the house or exit the house and people do it. You might not enter the house or exit the house or eat or enter the toilet or leave the toilet without any remembrance of Allah Ta'ala. No bismillah, no a'udhu billah, nothing. The jinn will possess you. So you are open the doors for him. You can open the doors or close the doors. And as we said, the way you close the doors for him is by guarding yourself with dhikr. Ma'awidhatain, the free calls that is, uh, saying Bismillah, always saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, not in circles, but in, uh, you know, before you do things, whenever you want to finish things, whenever you want to eat, before you consummate with your wife, and it's a very important time because, you know, we always say Bismillah before you consummate, because the shaitan could affect the child in the future by the will of Allah. So we were commanded and warned about this. That whenever you consummate, before you consummate, there's a dua and you say, Bismillah. Hey Allah, what? Fadal ya Azad. Absolutely, you are allowed to do it to child. Why? Did I, mean, did I not mention proof for it? Can you remind me of the proof I mentioned? You are allowed. Where's the proof? I mentioned it in my speak. How do you know if you're possessed? Did I not mention about six ways of understanding that? Did I not mention that? At least six or seven. Or last. Oh, I mentioned about ten of them, didn't I? Mention two. two. Mention two. No, I didn't mention lack of faith. I mentioned what are the symptoms, what are the signs of possession? I mentioned at least ten. Give me two of them. Allah ya khadak ya azal Who's going to help Azad? Ahmed Yeah, there you go Epileptic attacks Nightmares, frequent nightmares So you know yourself, ya Azad, that you are different in personality, in action, in ways you know, a person knows his life, right? He knows his way. Suddenly he changes. And he continually changes and changes. Because if you are possessed, it just increases. Increases on you. The evil increases. 
gene. Because like I said, the symptoms, if you know the symptoms, you know it's a gene. That's not always. You could be an epileptic person, because it's a disease. You could have that, and you might not be epileptic. But however, generally, a lot of them are. Can we eat the animal that is slaughtered by a magician? In other words, can we eat an animal that is slaughtered by a mushrik? Because he's a mushrik. He's a mushrik. Why? Because he has committed shirk. He has accepted the devil uh, as to be worshipped. Because the devil will not help you unless you worship him. So you absolutely are uh, haram for you to eat the food of the mushrikun. I've got a question, but also, doesn't it say you can eat from the Jewish and the Christians? Doesn't it? Ahsan Allah alayk. وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلٌّ لَكُمْ وَطَعَامُهُمْ حِلٌّ لَهُمْ The Jews, the Mushrik, the Mushrik, the Mushrik is not like the idol, I'm talking about the idol worshippers here or people that directly worship other beings, right creatures. Now the people of the scripture are people who have been uh, revealed to books, correct? And the Christians and the Jews are not like the pagan idol worshippers. Big difference. And anyway, regardless, Allah has allowed this. The argument is, Allah has allowed it. Nike is a symbol of a goddess. And the most experienced person in the Nike section is our brother Ihsan Jacobs. MashaAllah, he's researched and studied so much so where he's needed a handkerchief to take the sweat off his face. After his research. And the conclusion was, inshallah, correct me if I'm wrong, Shaykhana, that Nike is a symbol of a goddess, like a god. Right? It's a god. I think to the Greek, to the Greek, uh, Greek gods or whatever. Regardless, it's a symbol of paganism. No matter what it is, what kind of god, goddess, goddess, it's a symbol of paganism. Whether we believe that or not, that is the essence of that tick. It is haram for every single Muslim to wear Nike. Haram. Not whether Allah I bought it two years ago, it cost me two thousand dollars, I'm not gonna get rid of it now. Grab all your Nike material and you'll be rewarded for this, wallahi. Grab it all, gather it together, wallahi, it would cost thousands of dollars. Grab it all, make a big fire. <laughs> A big fire. Let your neighbors attend this gathering. And say, if you got any night products, give them to me as well. And get rid of it all. And you will be rewarded, wallahi, for this. You will be rewarded and you haven't lost. Pardon. Adidas is not like, inshallah, different, 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 different subject altogether. If you have a shoe, for example, and it is possible to remove the logo all off a shirt to you after you have bought it, now you're not going to buy no more, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, we are all accepted. We accept it now that Nike is not a Muslim's dress or fashion. So we do not buy it no more, alhamdulillah. But we've got clothes that we can sort of change. We can transform it into another thing. If you can take the Nike logo off, beautiful, do that. If you can do it, Genuinely, you can do it. Do it. Inshallah, you can safeguard the rest of the material. If you cannot destroy it, gathering it, likewise covering it, not a pro yes, not a problem. But you never ever buy it. No more. But if you have bought it in the past and you got not not material, do this. If you can't do it, like I said, burn it, bury it, feed it to the animals. Give it to me, I'll give it to Jack the Ripper. That's my goat and he loves uh, shirts.